Welcome to Season 2 of the DOV Family Podcast. Thanks for joining us. We're here with our very first guest, Father James Dvorak. So Father James currently serves as parochial vicar at Our Lady of the Gulf Parish in Port Lavaca and his three mission churches, St. Joseph's Port O'Connor, St. Anne's Point Comfort, and St. Patrick's in Seadrift. Father James was ordained just over a year ago on May 30th, 2020, alongside Father Chase Goodman and Father Dalton Irvin, and plans to eventually join the military as a chaplain, something we'll talk about in this podcast. Father James, thanks for making time for us. Thank you, Justin, for having me. So we have a lot to talk about, but I uh, always love starting with this question, Father James. Tell us about your vocation journey. So how did you go from James to Father James? How did you discover God was calling you to become a priest? Okay. Um, uh, for me, my vocation story, um, I grew up cradle Catholic. Um, I have one older brother, so we were kind of a small family, two loving parents, a very supportive um, in, in, all, in just our life of faith together. Always went to Mass on Sunday, always prayed together our meals. Um, so always the, the faith was very much a part of our lives. Um, my particular the vocation of the priesthood um, for me um, was uh, kind of started on my eighth grade year um, when I was getting ready, in eighth grade, get before high school yet. Um, but I was in CCD classes. I went small town. Uh, I'm originally from Frelsburg. Um, so small town, in my CCD class, there were uh, six, maybe eight of us. So pretty small, small group mm-hmm. we had. Um, but it was that eighth grade year for me and my vocation story that um, was different than the other years. And the way that we um, learned about our faith, it wasn't just learning anymore. That year we actually started to uh, become more involved. And it was really, a, in a sense, that call to service. Um, we got involved in uh, living out our faith, practicing our faith, as opposed to just sticking uh, with the books. And so um, there was something there that kind of sparked that interest, um, really even before the priesthood, but just that, like, our call to faith in me and my journey that really um, started to live out my faith, taking it more seriously. Um, So that service, but also that year, um, I was introduced to uh, Eucharistic uh, adoration, mm-hmm. making a holy hour, mm-hmm. um, and beginning that that life of prayer, and that's really where I think that that silent time with Christ um, was a big part of of that call to the priesthood, along with that call to service of being involved. Um, also, I always grew up before that even was uh, serving on the altar. Um, I know my brother and my cousins; we always uh, did that together. Again, in a very small parish, it was something uh, me looking up to them and just really enjoying being. Uh, that close to the altar and serving that way with the priest um, would always enjoy that and especially as I throughout later on would do it more and more um, as we go and so there was always that kind of always that growing um, so it really started on that eighth grade year but then going into high school um, I did keep actually let me back up first that eighth grade year uh, I got in contact with Father Dan Morales who was okay. the vocation director at that time and um, they just started the vocation camp for the diocese, which was Cool Bodies, is called it, is what it's called. And so um, I asked if I could go, but at that time I was too young. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, and so I mean, before that we were having conversations about a call, discernment to the priesthood, and and that. So I really kind of got in touch with him um, through that. And then, uh, so yeah, I missed the first year vocation camp. Okay. And then once I was in high school, then I, I kept it open, continued to pray, like I said, making that Eucharistic adoration with frequency. Um, and then uh, then the next year I could go. And so f- really for the first time, I got to um, get to see the life of the priesthood on a daily life, right? Getting to pray with them, um, discern them, seeing the life of a seminarian. Um, we also had, there was Father Philip Brun, who's um, also from my hometown. He's six years older than me as well. So um, I did know him growing up. Uh, his younger brother was my age and my older brother was his age. So, you know, we were, again, small town. We knew each other pretty well. So it, it was helpful having him around as well in that part of that process. But the vocation camp was um, always something I looked forward to each summer that I went every year throughout mm-hmm. high school, mm-hmm. um, even to, to continue to develop that uh, nurturing of that call that was was constantly growing throughout high school because I always kept it open um, as I felt that call there. So for me, it's it's not a very interesting story, mm-hmm. I think, right? You prayed, but, yeah, I, and I mean, you had great pretty, people around you that supported you. That's really what it was. Yeah. It was just, I mean, very, just the slow and steady growth in that, that call. And like I said, I was really blessed to have that uh, yeah. uh, family that was supportive. Um, again, all those people of our diocese that helped Father Dan, all those good and holy priests that were there. Uh, along the way, seminarians, uh, that kind of brotherhood mm-hmm. that you, you form even when, when seminary gets going too. And 
Um, he asked them in high school, uh, when it was time to graduate high school, um, talking with Father Dan, um, there was, uh, yeah, making that decision to go, you know, was, and I did visit seminaries also that my junior year in high school, mm-hmm. Father Dan took me to uh, HTS, Holy Trinity Seminary, mm-hmm. um, in Dallas there, and then also St. Benedict's in Louisiana, mm-hmm. and so I got to visit both. A um, little fun story there, I I went to Dallas first, and it was snowed in, mm-hmm. and uh so I didn't get to go to the classes, but it's a very academic school, and I wasn't really look f- looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, but when I went to Louisiana, you know, loved it. They have I don't know how many acres. It's uh, and more just, like Frelsburg. Yeah, you exactly. Know, I mean, they have ponds. You know, you yeah. could go fishing, just different things, just beautiful yeah. nature. You know, you could go out in the in the trails and walk and stuff. And, and as soon as we left there, I was like, I want to go there. No, that's but, awesome. But, so that's uh, where you went to seminary. I did not. So oh, they sent me to Dallas. Oh, <laughs> see, you said your story was simple, but there's there's some well, twists they, yeah, and turns a, we're yeah, going to talk that, about. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but no, and that's what the so yeah, not what I would have preferred, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, but again, God was kind of at work at it all because it did definitely challenge me um, in that, and it, it I think it was where I needed to be because once leaving uh, after high school, going to seminary, going to big city Dallas. Um, was a big shock. Oh, and yeah. So that on top of the academics and just that, all those changes was uh, quite a change of, of life, you know, pretty much. But again, you have a good group of seminarians together and living the faith um, through it all was, was a good journey. It's really what I needed to grow in my formation um, to make me a, a good and a better priest mm-hmm. uh, today in that formation. So. Well, very cool. Well, you know, thinking back on your story, it's like that organic model that's the catholic model i think sometimes we think to get vocations we got to slip a cd to a kid at the right time or invite him to this thing but really you know and, and if uh, folks are interested i mean um they can go to the youtube page and we have 12 other story vocation stories you know a common thread that i've seen in them is eucharistic adoration father christopher Fuchs, he did the same thing as you and in high school he made a weekly visit to adoration mm-hmm. and then serving growing up i mean those two things seem so so key but you know is that something you found among fellow seminarians i mean most of them kind of had that support growing up or came from those it was more that stable organic path than like some maybe watershed moment if you will yeah i well i get yeah, it a little everyone, bit of a mix everyone has their own story yeah. right and so yeah i think it is a little bit of a mix because um, there are those, I mean, you talk to more of the, maybe the older vocations that, you know, if they go off to college or, you know, right. whatever, like they, at some point, right, they all, you know, maybe turn or they have like these rough spots, um, you know, but, but of course, then in that conversion step, I think it does, right? So to answer your question, yes, I guess it does have the, the adoration, the Eucharist as a part of that, cultivating that um, in that process back, you know, mm-hmm. but um, yeah. So all of them Eucharistic, though, right? I mean, I, yeah, I think, I think a so. love of Christ in the Eucharist. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what Father Tommy, right, the vocations poster most recently, was men after the Eucharistic heart of Jesus. Like, whoa, that's awesome. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's your pastor, that's right? right? That's, that's right. right. You see him every day. <laughs> that's right. So um, could you maybe talk about what was it like first discovering the call? You know, you're an eighth grader, and I was just reading a little bit of a book by Dr. Ray Garendi. He's a pretty popular Catholic psychologist he's written lots of books about raising kids um something i thought was interesting in that book is he said that nowadays we have this this notion that middle school or teen years those are tough years but it it wasn't always that way i mean you think back 100 200 years a farmer wasn't upset his kid was a teen his farmer was excited he's like he's bigger he can do more now take more responsibility you know you and father christopher's stories are kind of similar as i'm hearing them just that early response so what was it like being an eighth grader, starting to want to spend more time in adoration, starting to think about following? What kind of emotions did you go through? And maybe what were some things you were maybe worried about or maybe how friends were reacting? What were you going through during that time? Yeah, um, I think first and foremost, like the slow, the beginning part of it was just still questioning, right? Like, you know, I, I feel something here. You know, God is is trying to tell me something. Um, but, you know, trying to figure that out was kind of the first you know, I don't, obstacle or part of that process. Um, not even worrying so much about you know my family or friends or any of that. Um, and that took took some time to to process that you know and really hear God you know speaking through that to to hear it be the call of the priesthood. Um, and that that can continue to be you know firm throughout that process. But then, of course, then when I did the vocation camps, then like my parents got involved, obviously you know, mm-hmm. um, and again very supportive and all that. Um, I almost had to, right, you got to be careful with that because they can almost be too supportive. Oh, yeah. Right? My wife, we have four boys, and my wife is like, 
you can do whatever you want, of course, whatever God wants. But you should all be priests. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. See, and that, you got to be careful with that, right? So, and uh, and but again, my parents are always supportive. Um, but just trying to keep that in check too. Again, which I think takes that prayer, that listening to God rather than just make about what Jesus wants. Exactly right. right. That's and what so, matters. so balancing that as well throughout the process. Um, and then in high school, like I said, for me it was again I always kept it very open, um, and I felt very strong. More and more called each each year throughout high school to the priesthood. And, um, yeah, I didn't really talk much about it to my, my classmates, those in high school. Um, I mean, probably part of it was a little, you know, kind of worried what they might think mm-hmm. or say, you know. But, mm-hmm. um, but others, I mean, my closer friends, we, I mean, they kind of knew too as well. Like they knew I would go to the camp and was, was thinking about it and mm-hmm. stuff. But, um, yeah, it was a little harder on that sense of uh, just with your classmates and peers kind of there. Because there is that pressure, right? You know, oh, it's, middle it's school not the and cool high school thing. years? Yeah, yeah, it's not the cool thing. But, um, but I heard another, um, there was a priest from, uh, back home and where, where I'm from originally, Orlando. Um, he said that when he finally worked up the courage to tell his friends, they were all very supportive. Did you find that, that as you told people, they were mostly supportive, your peers, or were some of them like, what are you doing? I think they, it's not that they were against it, right? Mm-hmm. But again, it, like I said, it wasn't the cool thing perhaps, you know, and, um, but all in all, I mean, yeah, so it wasn't. You know, they weren't persecuting me or attacking me or anything yeah. like that. But, um, but yeah, I guess not really necessarily. So I guess indif- indifferent would be the best word to mm-hmm. um, to put it in that sense, at least of those, um, yeah, from school. But, you know, again, our, our faith community, my hometown, home parish, um, obviously, again, all the support. Oh, celebration, right? Yeah, of yeah, course. Right? Just kind of in the, in the public, you know, sector was uh, kind of that indifference. Well, you I and guess. Father Philip must be so cool for Frelsburg. To oh see yeah, both <laughs> you guys. You guys, when you go there, it must be like yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so your, I mean, your story's given me a lot of hope as a father of four young boys. You know, because um, also talking to Bishop about his journey. You know, may, maybe our maybe our kids can find their vocations young. You know, because Bishop, you know, it shared in his that you know when he was scared at night as a kid, he would pray the rosary, grab the rosary off his bedpost, and, and pray it. You know, so uh, I think for all the parents listening to just have hope that, that you can help your, your child hear the Lord's voice early, you know, and find their path early, you know. Um, it's kind of like our culture says that everyone has to go through this drifting phase or what have you. But that's not, that's not necessarily true, and Scripture points us towards that. If you raise a child in the way he should go, he will walk in it. So we can take a lot of hope in that. Um, what advice would you give to anyone who thinks they might have a religious vocation? First and foremost has to be that prayer, right? I mean, again, for me in that Eucharist, and like you said, too, with other vocations, we have to listen to God. And I think for, again, my experience, Eucharistic adoration, that yeah. quiet time yes. to hear God, I think that's that's a must as far as to make sure that call is authentic. Um, and then kind of like in light of what you were just saying with there's the pressure, like even for me growing up, I. I, I was so blessed to be from a small town with a good community, family, and parish that we, I didn't have the same, you know, threats or challenges mm-hmm. that, say, larger towns, right? The, the, you know, the peer pressure, the people you hang out with, um, you know, all that will, can pull you away from hearing God's call, you know, what we do in that, that um, it's important to remember those things, right? Again, listening to God making sure we we're doing what we suppose we're supposed to and mm-hmm. not not drifting right not being subtle with with our friends right if they're not directing us closer to christ and we're not allowing them as well to bring them to god then then we need to maybe you know check that Re-evaluate. right and so yeah all of our friendships and relationships that we do so i think check those, yourself before you wreck yourself that's right that's right <laughs> so, i just came up with that that's good that's good <laughs> yeah. yeah it's uh it's very encouraging to hear and so you went in right out of high school Correct. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Way to go, Father James. That's great. Um, what would you encourage parents who, you know, might be trying to encourage their children to consider a religious vocation? What advice would you give parents? I would say, again, support them. Yeah. Um, but, again, be careful with that, right, to, to not over 
put the pressure, you know, extra pressure, um, but also pray with them, right? Take them to adoration. Yeah. I mean, I think, again, that's so important just to spend some quiet time. If it's, you know, if an hour is too much to begin with, you know, to start somewhere, you know, pray, pray the rosaries of family, do mm-hmm. those things that be the example and the witness of living out a vocation. Right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's so important when they see that, you know, again, like I had two loving parents, you know, I mean, they, they had their problems too, but they still, at the end of the day, were able to live out the faith. And so you see that, right? Cause we all struggle and, and to live that example and to stay together, right. That through that, mm-hmm. the gift of faith that we have, that we all have a vocation. And so again, let's just discern it as God's calling us to it, not to, you know, feel like we have to go this way or we can't go this way. Um, so yeah, I, I think that prayer and that example is, is one of the, those key things. Yeah. We all have that, uh, first primary call to holiness. So mini catechism lesson, we all have the primary call to holiness. Right then, our secondary or our um, secondary call, if you will, is then how are we meant to live out that vocation? What mode of life? But uh, funny you mentioned hearing God, my my six year old at breakfast this morning, because we've been trying to read the gospel before breakfast as part of our prayer. Then we try to talk about it during breakfast. <laughs> um, we because today's gospel was who is my mother or father or sister or brother or whoever does the will of my father, and uh, I was like, what does it mean to follow Jesus? And my son's like, to be a disciple. I was like, well, what does a disciple do? I'm like, listens to Jesus. He's like, I can't hear Jesus. He's never talked to me before. But I remember uh, talking to the Schaefer's deacon, Matthew, said that, you know, even from the youngest age, and I want to start doing this with my son, they would make space for that. You know, like, even if they're six-year-olds, like, go talk to God. If he went out in the yard and just was in quiet, found a frog, and they asked parents, what would you hear from, or parents asking, what would you hear about from God today? said, well, I saw beautiful nature, uh, I felt peaceful, and look, I met a frog. It's like, that's just starting there, like giving kids the space, yeah. you know? So, mm-hmm. I don't know if there's anything to that, just making the space, right? Sure. That's right, yeah. How there's you... so many distractions in life, right, yeah. that we can, we get busy with work or whatever it is, right? We, we fill our lives with, or our lives get full whether we want them or not, but, yeah. and so we have to block out that time, right, for prayer and that, that listening, that intentional um time where we can I mean like this past Sunday's gospel was that balance between work and rest you mm-hmm. know they um, we need to make sure we're we're doing the work that we need to but also taking that time that we need to rest to be in the presence of God yeah. um, that reorients our work and directs it yeah. yeah I think like anything else in life can be proactive or reactive so you know I mean I slip into this all the time you know it's like are we going to be reactive and give God our leftover time or are we going to be proactive and and put those things in order at that time with God, that time listening to him. So, um, so yeah, we just, you know, primary vocation called holiness. So something we all share, then the secondary call, if you will, how to live out that vocation. But now let's shift gears and talk about for you that call within the call, right? So I have a picture of St. Teresa of Calcutta, Mother Teresa, but reason I, uh, brought her pictures because she also said she had a call within a call. She was called to be a religious sister, but then the call within the call for her was to serve the poor. And that's what led to her starting the Missionaries of Charity. It's a beautiful story. If, if um, folks aren't familiar with it, I mean, there's you can find documentaries on her life, just about any streaming service nowadays. But, um, you know, she heard that call to, to serve the poor and left uh, the school where she was, she got permission from her bishop and everything, but started serving the poorest of the poor. But um, you have a call within a call uh, to eventually join the military as a chaplain. The, an auxiliary bishop for the Archdiocese of the Military Services was there with Bishop Cahill at your ordination. That was so cool to see. Do so you mind sharing about how, how that happened? How did you discover that call within the call? Yeah, so I kind of left out that part in the, 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 the discernment <laughs> process. Um, yeah, so for me as well, uh, in that high school time frame, as I was discerning a call to the priesthood, um, I always did have an interest or desire to serve in the military as well. And um, and that was something I kind of did wrestle with um, going back and forth. And, and Father Dan was a part of that uh, process conversation um, with that discernment as I was trying to uh, pray with that um, because I was torn, right? There, it's either the military or the priesthood. And so, um, you know, Father Dan, you know, first kind of, well, you could actually do both, right? You could be a chaplain Why serving, not both? yeah, you know, <laughs> serving the military and um, 
and being a priest. I just gotta say, Father Dan, he just I w- he just sounds amazing. I mean, every yeah. interview Father Dan comes up, but I could see I don't I have I never got a chance to meet. Him. I could just see him saying like, you know, you could do both. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, I mean that's that's pretty much yeah <laughs> verbatim. Um, but yeah, you know, but again, like for me at that time, it was um, in my prayer life, I wasn't ready. Um, that's, that wasn't what I had in mind when I thought to serve the military. Right? I wanted to be a combatant. I wanted to serve. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and so uh, so I told him at the time when I was getting ready to apply, because um, at that time when you apply, you, you can apply with the Archdiocese to be a co-sponsored seminarian um, where, where they would, um, you're co-sponsored, so they both support you in the formation process, and it's, a, it's an agreement that you will go off to serve once you serve your diocese for three years, then you'll go and serve the military uh, for some period of time for a few years, and then you'll return back to the diocese. Um, but at that time, I was like, no, that's not what I wanted, uh, not what I had in mind of, of serving. So I, I did feel called to the priesthood, and so uh, you know, I said, we'll just, you know, we'll just stick with the diocese, put the military on hold. I didn't feel called in that way, so um, I let it go. Applied, went to seminary, went to Dallas for those, uh, you know, for those years. And it was about that second year um, in formation when I kind of threw prayer and that had... I feel like that was a good idea. Well, not... Father Dan. <laughs> well, I, it wasn't necessarily that, but it was part of the... Just like looking into it, like maybe this, maybe there's something to it, right? Mm-hmm. So it's still very unsure. Uh-huh. Um, and so um, so I, I, I prayed about it a little more and still, still uneasy, you know, waiting uh, to see. And then, uh, again, it took more years even just to to go through that yeah. um, to be sure. And then finally, really in theology, it was, um, I was in second theology, so that was year six of, of formation. Um, so yeah, it took, you know, right there six years plus, you know, on, on coming to round of like, at least being able to, wanting desire to then, again, still not sure, but the desire to seek it out more in a more intentional way. And so um, so I asked the bishop, or I asked through, um, through Father Dan at the time, he was still, uh, vocation director and, and uh, Bishop Cahill, um, I asked him if I could discern that the archdiocese put on a retreat, discernment retreat, just like our diocese has, but those in the military. And so I, uh, he said yes, very graciously, uh, very excited actually. Um, I could see yeah. And, and again, I was like, this, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not committing to anything. I just want to see, you know, just uh, part of the prayer. And so uh, that that retreat was in California, mm. and so I went out there to Menlo Park. Um, St. Pat's Seminary, um, and they had, uh, so there is a very different dynamic than our diocesan uh, retreats. Ours are more for the youth, younger, um, younger age, you know, high school, kind of college uh, men, but that retreat is, you'll see a lot more actually from the military on mm-hmm. active duty, uh, but those just like us as well that um, come out either, some are seminarians, some are um, just like I would have been in high school, still discerning that possibility as well. And so you, again, the same dynamic of what our retreats were, you get to see seminary, well, you get to see priests and, yeah, seminarians. There were some co-sponsored seminarians that, the, but military chaplains and priests that you kind of get to see and hear their stories and, and what that life looks like as a priest and military chaplain. And so um, after that retreat, again, I was um, pretty pretty well decided. I had a great conversation with the, a couple of the chaplains, but particularly the um there was the Navy chaplain, and uh, I had a great conversation with him. And I was already leaning more towards the Navy branch, particularly, okay. which I guess we can get into that. Yet, oh, but. man, the call within a call within a call. Oh, the call, yeah. That's right. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so I kind of was committing there. But, but yeah, after that retreat, all in all, was um, I was pretty much ready, and then I asked the bishop if I could pursue then the, the discernment with being, making an official, being a co-sponsored seminarian, uh, which, again, very excited and, and supportive through it all. So... Um, you know, we got that paperwork done, and then I had those three years still in seminary um, that, that, again, they supported. So now my current track is that um, being ordained, like you said, the Archbishop was, Auxiliary Bishop was there for, on behalf of the Archdiocese, and now being ordained, I'll serve the Diocese of Victoria for three years, mm-hmm. and then uh, an agreement that I'll serve the military, the Archdiocese, for a minimum of five years. Okay. Um, and then again, of course, the bishop always will, will be in that process and discernment throughout the way if we uh, if it'll be longer or um, or however that journey develops or progresses as we go. So, um, wow. 
well, double thank you for yes. serving as a priest and then also going to serve in the military when that, when that time comes. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit about that, if you don't mind, the Navy. Why the Navy? Sure. Yeah, so at that time, too, um, on the retreat that we had, the, the Navy was actually the— um, they were in the highest demand for priest, Catholic uh, priest. Okay. And um, so, yeah, that was kind of the—really, that was the biggest factor, I think, because, yeah. again, the whole point of why I'm doing this is to serve is to serve the need, right? They, they're, there are so few priests. Uh, There's another, another commonality with her call within a call, because she, she went because they weren't being served. She went to love and serve those who needed it. Exactly. So, Yeah, and that's, that was, yeah, so that was the biggest part. But then just kind of the other plus, like I said, talking with the chaplain as well, just the great experiences. And um, the Navy has a lot of diversity in it of itself, right? There's, you got, I mean, there's as a chaplain, even serving them, there's so many different, um, ways in which to serve because you have, you know, you could be on an aircraft carrier ship, you know, and, and with the sailors, um, you could be on the amphibs with the Marines mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, on their bases and, and different things that, with the Marines. Um, you got the air squadrons, you can be on it with an air wing, oh with gosh, air, wow. you know, so it's, I mean, right, you know, air, land and sea, right. They cover it all pretty much. Mm -hmm. So a lot of diversity in that, which yeah. I don't know is a good thing, but it'll be very different along the way. A lot of different options too. So, um, but one of the things, part of that too, just hearing the numbers were, um, like our diocese, active priests in our diocese, there's about, we lost a couple now, maybe f there was 40 something, maybe 30. Active priests? Active priests. I would think it's in 40s. 40 I think it was 42 right? last I heard. Okay. Um, but um, in the military, there's 50, in the Navy branch, 50 something. It was low 50s, I think. Yeah. But of those, only 30 something, like mid 30s, could were deployable. Uh, I mean, like of good health, it could actually go overseas. Oh, yeah. So like, and I mean, I think we're covering the globe, right? And so that's a difficult. Again, there's just not enough priests to go around. Right. Uh, and all that. Well, there's something I think a lot to be said too about giving God your first fruits, right? He calls us to give Him our best, and you know, it's like. You're young. I mean, you probably could could go serve in the other way you wanted to serve. Sure, you know, God sure. called you in this way, and you're going. Sure. You're going now where there's where there's the most need. So, um, yeah, very inspiring. So let, let's all make sure to pray for Father James as he, um, you know, gets ready for that. And let's see. You know, a little under two years now would be mm -hmm. the three year mark. That's right. All right. Um, and how providential that uh, right now you're there with Deacon Richard who will be Father Richard this coming year, Lord willing. And uh, he was in the Army. He was an Army chaplain, right? Correct, yes. But at the time, he was Church of the Nazarene. That's right. But it, through, and I loved it. I, when he told me, I just couldn't believe it. It was through being a, like connected to the RCIA program in Afghanistan, because they were doing RCIA in Afghanistan for soldiers that, mm -hmm. you know, his his interest in the faith got further peaks. So I just think it's a really fascinating world, like what's going on in the Archdiocese of, for the military services sure. and the, out, the things we have here happening there, you know, mm -hmm. RSA, adult formation class, sacramental preparation, you know. Right. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how much this really will be a training ground for you, these three years of priestly ministry in our diocese, how that might prepare you for right. wherever you are yeah, with the Navy. That's right. Well, Father James, um, thank you so much again. I mean, you could definitely write a book, but, you know, maybe maybe just give it a few more years. You'll even have I a better one. I just got out one. of school. Yeah, all right. Take a little right. break. Eh? <laughs> you're a little busy right yeah, now. Yeah, that's right. You know, but if you're out there on sea, you know, with some spare time, maybe start jotting a manuscript. So, but we'll um, <laughs> maybe just as a closing question, what's one thing, anything you'd want people listening to hear? Well, Sam, I mean, since we're talking about vocations, uh, again, I think it's so important that we continue to pray the importance of listening to God in our lives, um, on our faith journey, that you know, we like to, we can't we can't do it alone. We can't do it our own way. God needs to be a part of it. You know, so like that and our families. You know, pray for them. Pray for priests and increase of vocations, mm -hmm. um, and pray for the priests that are there. Right, that they may be good and holy men to serve, um, to build up Christ's church here on earth, and you know, for to get us all to heaven. Right, that beautiful uh, message that we have. It's so important that we need need to continue to just keep that prayer life. Amen. Well, yes, folks listening, please pray for your priests, support your priests. And um, vocations will be a major theme of the podcast this fall. So please subscribe um, to the podcast. We have several priests that will be part of episodes, including a special series with Father Dalton Irvin 
uh, monthly episodes specifically on vocations and different angles related to vocations. The first episode was with Bishop Cahill, but he has some really uh, neat things planned. So look forward to the whole fall podcast. Father James, thanks again for sharing your journey today. And um, would you mind closing us with a prayer? Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the gift of our lives, uh, your blessing that you always bestow upon us, the gift and the faith of your Son, Jesus Christ, that he may always continue to guide us, that we may hear his call, his witness in our lives, and that we may ultimately follow him, however you call us in that daily life, to respond and accept the will that you have for us, that we may live good and holy lives, and we may persevere in our faith to give you glory now and forever. And we ask all these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.